everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Catholic Talk Show. I'm really excited. This is our first show where we actually have a guest joining us, Michael Knowles from The Daily Wire. Michael, thanks for joining us. It's a great honor to be, and, and a great topic to be the first guest on. Yes, yes. Are you a bad Catholic? That's the topic. That what question wasn't directed at you. Yeah, I mean, I, think we, know, I think we know the answer, though. Yeah, it's more of an intervention than a talk show today. <laughs> Michael, um, your friends and family are outside. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to spring it on you like this on a show. Yeah, that's really, oh really. Oh, my gosh. As always, we have uh, Ryan Scheel and Father Rich with us. And if you're joining us on YouTube, hello, hello, hello. Um, Ryan, you, know, you want to kind of... Sure. Dive yeah. Before we get started, um, I want to make sure everyone goes uh, to CatholicTalkShow.com. Uh, when you go there, you can subscribe, uh, you know, follow us on Stitcher, CastBox, iTunes, whatever. Make sure you're uh, leaving reviews. It really helps us get the show out to more people. And if you don't, Father Rich, do you think it's fair for us to say that if they don't do that, they are bad, bad Catholics? Catholics. Totally qualify as a bad Catholic. Yeah. And yeah. trust me, you don't want my pastoral <laughs> pursuit after you. If you are a bad Catholic, yeah, I mean, I'm he, coming to get you. He's wearing a tracksuit. He can run you down. <laughs> <laughs> and the whole reason I came out to LA is to come and see you, Michael. So here we go. I cannot wait to get this thing going here. <laughs> no mercy. No mercy here. <laughs> so, you know, I, what we're talking about today is some of the things that I... I think there's stigmas attached to that, you know, are really kind of common vices that a lot of times people feel maybe separates themselves from the church or maybe would categorize them as a bad Catholic. But they're things that, you know, I think most people do. It's, you know, do you smoke? Do you drink? Do you, know, do you swear? You know, you, you drugs. Know, drugs. For, for the record, I thought those things made me a good Catholic. I thought I thought that was like the best thing I had going there. Hey, the you're, giving, you're and, giving away the show now. <laughs> <laughs> You know, so we're going to talk about each one of those. Your family's still out there. Yeah. <laughs> keep yourself in line, man. We can have them in here in a moment's notice. <laughs> so, you know, oh we're going to talk gosh. about all those things and see, you know, does that really make you a bad Catholic if you, you know, have four or five beers, smoke a, you know, pipe after, you know, smoking a joint and, and swearing, swearing at somebody? <laughs> I mean, is that, you know, grounds yeah. for excommunication or, you know, is that... Uh, yeah. Is that licit in and, lifestyle? And, yeah. And like the, the way I look at it too, is like people, a lot of people do stuff like that and, and they, they feel like they're not worthy to come into the church too, you know? And it's like, um, no, we, yeah, there's some people. Yeah. You know, I've, I've been to his house on the weekend, you know, and it's, you know, it's kind of good to hear this kind of stuff. Yeah. It is. So uh, smokers and drinkers so, and yeah, partiers. Right. Who's, who's yeah, talking who, first? Who's the, who's the authoritarian on this subject? Really? I guess oh, you, well. Sheila. Uh, uh, um, so. Speaking from personal experience, <laughs> I could I can I can accurately say that I have done everything on this list. Yeah. Me too. Yeah, it's all right. I'm actually doing it now. Yeah. I'm out of at the moment. <laughs> He's only it's all mixed in car. that coffee yeah. cup in front of you right now. <laughs> I, we have to keep his mic, uh, you know, <laughs> the, <laughs> cut the lines. He's just over there. Beep, 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 beep. No, but I mean, like, let's talk about tobacco or, right. so, you know. So, you know, the church, there's a long history of interactions with the church and tobacco. And a lot of that comes from the fact that the areas that produce tobacco and introduce tobacco to the world were you know, colonized by the Portuguese and the Spanish. And part of that trade, um, they would bring tobacco back to Europe. And, you know, the a lot of the missionaries and a lot of the colonial powers, their big source of income was tobacco. And it was something that really powered the colonization of these countries. Uh, because of that, tobacco flooded Europe, Catholic Europe. And a lot of, you know, pretty funny anecdotes came out of that introduction of tobacco to Catholic Europe. You know, for example, when they first started bringing tobacco back, it was okay, you know, but we all know how tobacco works. People, you, you don't casually have tobacco. You're either a fiend or maybe not at all, right? Perfect moderation is, uh, or no, perfect abstinence is easier than perfect moderation. And, Speak for yourself. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so it had gotten so bad, though, once the Spanish were bringing um, tobacco back into Europe, that the popes actually had to start writing bulls about how to address the rampant use of tobacco inside of the churches. Um, there was actually a papal bull excommunicating anybody who used tobacco 
inside of the church, the Cathedral of Seville. You know, th- this was a very important moment in papal history because it is a, the strongest argument yet against papal infallibility. It really reminds us, you know, that the Pope is only infallible uh, when he isn't fallible. And I got to tell you, in all the look, there have been some times at which uh, the clergy have made some mistakes. I think this might be the biggest mistake ever made in the history of the Catholic Church. Well, well I don't on think another so. show, we talk about how they say coffee is Satan's drink. Mm, that's so, right. Yeah. <laughs> I forgot that, actually. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> I think that one takes the cake personally, especially as I'm enjoying this nice it's a yin dark and yang roast right now. <laughs> So no, actually, Pope Urban VIII, uh, on January 30, 1642, issued a bull come Ecclesia, which he said, he, the dean of the Cathedral of Seville wrote to the Pope saying, look, these tobacco users are just getting, they're getting this stuff everywhere. They're spitting, they're smoking, they're snorting, it's all over my <laughs> altar. Help me out here, right? So he wrote that any, so the Pope in response, Pope Urban VIII wrote in response that anybody who is using that is automatically excommunicated on the spot. They don't even have to be formally excommunicated just by the very act of doing it, they're excommunicated. He must have been mad. <laughs> you know, like, it must have been bad. It must have been very bad. <laughs> I mean, growing up in New York and, and visiting some of my Italian family members, you know, and going into their house and yeah. seeing just like these nicotine stained yeah. walls, you know, and that smell of smoke, and there's always a cigarette lit up inside of the house. You know, it's obviously a different time and yeah. era right now. I will tell you, when I, growing up in New York in an Italian-American family, I was in the cloud of smoke. I was <laughs> living in it all of the time. And I always hated cigarettes. But I would go grocery shopping on Arthur Avenue, the Italian neighborhood oh, down there. Great mm. neighborhood. And so I started smoking cigars. I think I was about 15, you know, and I was old. I was like, that was like kind of old for the neighborhood. I, I met one time uh, Mayor Rudy Giuliani, and I said, how old were you when you started smoking cigars? He said, I was 11. <laughs> I was 11. That's a little more standard. Amazing, you know? dude. Something about that culture. I don't know, like Italian yeah. Catholic culture. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's all we needed is another Italian Catholic. in the I street. know. I, you are <laughs> surrounded, my brother. <sighs> surrounded. As our legion. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So anyway, though, you know, it was really a response to the fact that there's there was no precedent for you know tobacco use or an addictive substance really being brought into churches. I mean, it had gotten so bad that priests were taking their snuff boxes and putting it on the altar. While they're in the middle of mass, they'd be like, you know. You know, <laughs> Blast- I knew a guy that that's uh, taught at a seminary who would split out after the homily and go outside and smoke a cigarette and come back <laughs> into mass. Are you serious? Literally. Yes. Yes. Whoa. Absolutely. So we're St. Actually- Joseph's in, in Louisiana. So we're actually going to. Oh, you're telling. We're actually going to get to that. I'm not going to name him. <laughs> so Benedict the uh, 13th, he actually. Um, use tobacco. He was one of the first popes that we know use snuff, right? Now, do you want to explain what snuff is? I love snuff. I I think I might be one of the few people in modern America who regularly enjoys snuff. So snuff is this nasal tobacco. It's this fine powder. And I think the the main use of it is to look whimsical and sneeze. (laughs) So I was driving out from New York to LA and we stopped in North Carolina by the Tobacco Emporium of America, you know, <laughs> wanted to get cigars and that kind of thing. And we see nasal snuff. If you buy a little package of nasal snuff, that is a lifetime supply. It somehow never diminishes, you know, it just fluffs up a little bit more. It's a, and it's a it's great- It's one of Jesus's miracles. It's the multiplication of the <laughs> snuff. Of snuff. The like I, had, I had an snuff. ounce of snuff and it was enough for a thousand people. Yeah. You know? <laughs> well, you know, you know, one of the great party tricks, we started uh, having it on the trip, is you'd go to a bar and you'd sniff a little snuff and the bartender would come over, you know, push up against a wall, say, what are you doing? And then you show them that you're you're not having that Colombian, you know, uh, <laughs> that import. That flake. That little, yeah, that's right. Yeah. You're, you're having this- <laughs> 19th century British dandy style tobacco <laughs> that it always kills. I really would really you like some it. British dandy? British dandy. <laughs> yeah. you have a little oh, you're doing dandy. It's yeah. sophisticated, mate. <laughs> now, if you were really a partier, you would hide your coke underneath that snuff. <laughs> and you're, you're, but then you're like, no, nah, dude, it's Bold snuff. It's all. cool. It's snuff. So Benedict the Thirteenth actually repealed that um, that bull and said, you know. I'm, I'm lifting the excommunication. You know, he was biased. He was using it himself. But there became the problem then that people, like you said, were leaving church to go outside and, and smoke. So they said, well, it's actually okay. You can smoke. So it used to be very common because they thought 
it's better for people to be nourished on the word of God and not leave mass mm -hmm. than it is to get smoky. So people used to just smoke pipes and cigars <clears throat> in St. Peter's during mass. And like all the churches of Europe, people are just... Well, you know, in fairness, it's the natural thurible. It's the thurible that God has provided for us from the new world because the body is a temple and the temple needs incense. That's there a great go. argument. About that? There you go. Infallible argument. <laughs> <laughs> now, I mean, a lot of popes actually use tobacco and they're saints who use tobacco. Um, Pius X used snuff. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Benedict XV, he didn't smoke. He hated cigarette smoke. So there is a long period where no one was smoking. But uh, John John the Twenty Third was a chain smoker. Pope Saint John Paul the no Pope Saint John the Twenty Third chain smoker. There's pictures of him smoking. I, I think Pius the Tenth smoked cigars too. He did. I think he was a fiend, right? Or just any kind of tobacco he could get his hands on. The rumor was that when Paul the Sixth uh, was elected, that it took like two years for the uh, smell of cigarettes to get out from how much John the Twenty Third smoked. <laughs> oh my goodness. It's like your family. It's oh, yeah. walls, you oh, yeah. know? You can't even paint over that stuff. I mean, you just have to like scrape it down. Yeah, it looks like yeah. a honeycomb. <laughs> there was a great tweet by Archbishop Wenske in Miami just like a week ago. And he's sitting on this barber's chair and he's got a cigar in his hand. And he's, he's like, the only place in Miami where you could get a haircut and smoke a cigar. <laughs> a so we're Havana. even talking about modern day. <laughs> Yeah. You know, priests and bishops. So, uh, you know, there was a, a, um, a Spanish nun who was, she was um, given the opportunity, this is like in the 1850s, she was given the opportunity to wear and look at the veil of St. Teresa of Avila. Mm -hmm. And she looked at it and she's like, I wanted to take it all in, in her recounting in her diary. I think she was a venerable. And uh, she's she's telling about how how she was, she was looking at it, she was smelling it. She's like, it was wrinkled, it was this color. She's like, there were spots and they smelled like good Spanish snuff. St. Therese was using so much, her she was just covered oh in it. Covered Seriously, in, yeah. You know, St. Therese, she's not the only saint to use tobacco. One of the great ones is uh, St. Philip Neri. And <laughs> that tobacco actually played a role in his canonization. It was, it was the only good argument against his canonization is they looked at his body and they saw that uh, the inside of his nose had worn away. And so therefore he wasn't incorrupt. Uh, the ar the counter argument made to this is that Philip Neri used so much snuff during his life that he wore away his nose. It was before he died. <laughs> it was before he died. The rest totally of his body fine. was incorrupt, yeah. but his, his nasal cavity was just demolished. Right. Uh, nope. nope. <laughs> <laughs> uh, same thing happened with uh, St. Joseph of Cupertino and uh, St. John Bosco. That was one of the main arguments of the uh, devil's advocate in their cases was that they were massively addicted to tobacco. Wow. Yep. Now, St. Bernadette, um, she was, you know, she was asthmatic, right? She had all kinds of health issues growing up. And one of the things that was prescribed to her by her doctor was snuff. You got <laughs> asthma, so they gave her snuff. It's, you know, I've got asthma. Yeah. <laughs> Can I have some of your <laughs> snuff? A little snuff, yeah. So I, give that a it's shot. It's brilliant. Yeah, but you know, this is this is you know, 1850s medicine. It's like uh, you got way. a runny nose. That means you got the you know, you got ghosts. What you need to do is here, eat some salt and drink. <laughs> eat some salt. Take a take an opium and smoke a weed. You know, <laughs> you know, you know. At that time, though, it was probably a good prescription because everybody was smoking like a chimney. Mm -hmm. So if you had asthma, I think the recommendation is no, no, no. Use the other kind of tobacco. You know, that'll help. Probably did help her asthma. I think the idea of it was almost to um, stimulate the you know, airways and to open them up to, I think that was their logic. I don't know. I've never, I don't have asthma and I've never done snuff. Well, apparently so. when you do snuff, you sneeze quite a bit You do sneeze quite a lot. Yeah. It's, uh, they, you know. It clears they, out the airway. <laughs> uh, St. Bernard. And I am the patron saint of handkerchiefs. Handkerchiefs. You're so going to be. I'm going to be. You're going to I'm be. going yeah. to be. That's right. I'm working in that we direction. We started the process. Yeah, I started the process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We'll it's see good, though after this, goal, yeah. after this yeah. episode, <laughs> if you don't, uh, if you don't come up as a bad Catholic, we'll see if you still apply for that. Um, you, you know, actually, St. Saint, Saint Bernadette Superior said to her one time, she said, she said, you're not going to be a saint because of how much snuff you use. Mm -hmm. And St. Bernadette said, well, then certainly you'll be a saint because you've never touched it. You know, kind of a little snarky comeback. 
but you know, one, you know, there's, one's a snake. There's that great story of I think it was uh, Benedict the Fourteenth. For some reason, all the Benedicts really like tobacco, and uh, Benedict the Fourteenth. Who knows if it's apocryphal? But some uh, lower clergy member comes up to him and says, uh, "You know, you've really got to quit the tobacco. Uh, it's it's a vice." And he said, uh, you know, because Benedict had offered him some tobacco. And he said, it's not a vice. If it were a vice, you would have some. And uh, I really, <laughs> Oh, that's brilliant. I really, I think I, I agree with Benedict on it. <laughs> you know, uh, the, yeah, the Pope's loved snuff. Um, when uh, Victor Emmanuel was coming in to negotiate the terms of the surrender of the papal states, the Pope was so mad at him and so offended by his... Um, he took By his away. terms, he took a snuff box and was smashing it on the <laughs> table and it broke. And he's like, this is unacceptable when he smashes, you know. And then then once, you know, they seated and, um, you know, they lost their temporal power, uh, he actually sold his gold encrusted snuff box in a lottery and then sold, gave the money to charity. It was like a big deal at the time. <laughs> Where can I get that snuff box? Where, at what auction can it's I find that? It's in a museum. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the Vatican Museum. Yeah. <laughs> now, you know, you know, St. John Vianney, mm -hmm. right? What, what is he really kind of known for? He's the patron of all priests and- Parish priests. Parish priests, yeah. yeah. And diocesan priests. Right, and he knew, he, one of his, you know, heroic virtues is just how long he would sit in the confessional. Yeah, mm -hmm. 16 to 18 hours. A day. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what he was doing on the other side of the screen? <laughs> Snuff. Snuff. snuff, just blasting yeah. snuff. You know? Padre Pio, Blast. same thing. Blasting Padre Pio snuff. had a Padre Pio had a hole in the side of his um, his um, uh, habit habit, mm -hmm. so that he can get easily access to his snuff box. See, you ha you're drawing a comparison here between those two guys who used to be in the confessional for a long time. That's right. Mm. That's true. You do need a little stimulation after a while. It might, you know, it gets, it can, can get a little boring. I says, I've never been in a confessional on the I've other never, side of it. I've been in the confessional, I think the most successive hours was like probably six hours or so. And I was in just such a deep state of consolation, almost to the point where I was sleeping. So yeah. <laughs> I think maybe it was just kind of to bring them back to like a greater awareness, sneeze a few hundred times, You're right. and then, you know, get, get back into the penitence. Man. Now, the party, the party, the tobacco party stopped, though. John Paul II, he despised tobacco. Mm -hmm. And he, yep. in 2002, he um, banned all smoking in Vatican City. You could not smoke anywhere, anything in Vatican City. Hmm. But what? But I understand that he hated tobacco. But then he did have a successor, didn't he? He did. Mm -hmm. And Benedict the Sixteenth. It's kind of well known, but there's no one, there's no pictures of. It, but he was. He's a smoker. He, he's, he's a Marlboro a, man. He, he really? was a <laughs> a Marlboro man. This is no, this. Really? Yeah, he liked Marlboro, Marlboro Reds. Reds. Well, yeah. That's what he smoked. <laughs> Oh my goodness. We're speaking in the past tense. I'm not so sure that that's fair. I suspect <laughs> in his retirement, Pope Benedict, you know, he needs to stay awake to write all the books that I hope he's writing. Right. And my, my favorite patron for all these like holy smokes groups out there, big shout out to all the, my college yeah. buddies and around FSU, yeah. UF that do these holy smokes. And, you know, Pierre Giorgio Frassati, JP2 had a great love and affection for Pierre Giorgio Frassati. And, you know, he was always seen hiking up mountains with that pipe in his mouth, just yeah. like a classic picture yeah. of who, who Giorgio Frassati was, you know, like just an awesome, awesome patron mm -hmm. for the Holy Smokes groups around the country. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And I mean, there's, there's a lot of other, you know, Chesterton and, you know, people the like Chesterton that. Chesterton groups. Yeah, yeah, they just smoke pipes and like, hmm, hmm, hmm. Fine bourbon. Yeah. yeah. Scotch. Mahogany. <laughs> well, there wasn't Snuff. that. The, I think the Chesterton line about the Catholic Church is that it is a thick steak, a good red wine, a, th a, a big red wine and a good cigar. I think mm -hmm. that was his description. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. I'll go with that. You know, it's apocryphal that additionally it said that... Um, and it's a, you know, great line of snuff. A too. great line of snuff, a just, couple bumps of Coke. Yeah, yeah. he really went, uh, you know, they edit that stuff out. <laughs> just a, you know, afterwards. Just a gummer, you know. <laughs> yeah, lucky lipper. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I, you know, I think, you know, speaking about drugs, let's, why don't we talk about that? Mm. Yeah. Ryan, you want to talk about drugs? Let's talk about drugs. Now, are we on the Joe Rogan show now? Is that, <laughs> has this transformed? <laughs> No, 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 no. This is the Catholic Talk Show. Yeah. Well, Go I, to catholictalkshow.com. Make sure you subscribe, like, follow us so you can hear all this, you know, priests and Italians and Catholics <laughs> talk about drugs and snorting tobacco. It's yeah. worth it. Like, subscribe.
Well, you know, I mean, I take ibuprofen all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know. <laughs> Sometimes you, when I when you I do too uh, yeah. <laughs> oh sometimes when I'm really chasing that dragon, I like to have a Benadryl right before bed. Oh, you can't imagine the slumber that I have. Uh, those aren't the kinds of drugs we're talking oh, about. Oh man, mm. I, I, we're talking you know, illicit my drugs. Life, boy, man. You ever you ever hear the the, the term um, the phrase a monkey can't sell bananas? I had a very bad effort of drug dealing in my life. <laughs> it just wasn't very good. I was like, yeah, what's, why aren't the finances working out yeah. here? <laughs> I don't understand it. So, oh. you, so you, you were a former drug dealer. Yeah. A tenth yeah. of drug dealer. You I just sucked at it. it. Yeah, I tried. It was a good effort. I know, I mean, we'll probably get into that story again, but uh, yeah. I know that story led to your conversion. Yeah. Yeah, it did. You know, it did. God was like, I'm going to make Ryan Delacrosse suck at selling drugs because that way he'll come to me. I think I made myself suck at it. But yeah, if, you, <laughs> if you'd like to interject God so, into that, then it makes me feel better yeah, about, right. about that. Yeah. So, you know, I think the catechism is very clear on the use of, of drugs. It's that it, it is a, um, it's a grave offense to, it says, uh, catechism number 2291 says, the use of drug inflicts very grave damage on human health and life. Their use, except on strictly therapeutic grounds, is a grave offense. Clandestine production of, of and trafficking in drugs are scandalous practices. They, con, uh, they constitute direct cooperation in evil since they encourage people to practice uh, gravely contrary to moral acts. Okay, so what constitutes a drug mm -hmm. in that regard? Right, so weed, coke, heroin. Weed's a drug because it's a drug. Yeah, okay. A little Haitian oregano, I think so. It does. Haitian it oregano it alters the, your mind. The, you know, it does. A little Peruvian parsley. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. The devil's cabbage. <laughs> the devil's cabbage. <laughs> I, you know, I've never. I'm just asking for a friend. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've never. Uh, I've never really liked drugs at all. The hardest drug I have ever tried was the was the old Peruvian parsley, you know. <laughs> and but I never, but I don't think it's because I'm a teetotaler or particularly um, uh, meticulous, you know, about that that sort of stuff. I think it's just that I'm too conservative, <laughs> so I I'm skeptical of new things, you know, older. Yeah. The, the good old fashioned drugs like booze and tobacco, yeah. I, I can kind of get behind. There's They've a been, track record. There's abuse. a track record. They've been proven over the test of time. That's right. But these other ones, you know, with all the letters and stuff at the weird rages and raves in the desert, yeah. Yeah, I can't, I don't, I don't trust that. I can't get into mm -mm. that. You it's not working out. Uh -uh. No, no, no. <laughs> it's definitely I just look, not working I look out. at all the people who do them and they all voted for Hillary. I think there's something wrong here. I don't <laughs> I don't think that I'm going to like this very much. <laughs> You're like, if I end up like that, <laughs> yeah. no way. I'm not even trying it. I'm not. Uh -uh. <laughs> so I'm going to grow think? a man bun. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Keep your snuff box in it. Yeah. <laughs> and all your uh, MDMA underneath your snuff. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> At a Hillary rally in the desert. I'm a, this is my this is my Dantesque vision of hell right now. That you're describing. What do you think, Padre? Smoking weed. I think I think it's a substance, obviously, that inhibits the hu human freedom, basically, yeah. and it alters the trajectory of one's decision making. Right. So if we are but called, so does booze. Oh, absolutely. But booze, in the same manner, can be abused to a point where our right. inhibitions and our freedom are severely altered. So the most important thing that is attributed to our likeness to God is our freedom. Mm -hmm. And our freedom, as John Paul II explains, mm -hmm. is rooted not in doing whatever we want to do on an impulse, but it is the freedom to choose and to enact good. It is only in choosing of the good that we experience some freedom. And in that free act of oneself directed toward others in goodness and love and virtue, do we start to establish something within the capacity of the human person that is truly rooted in our likeness to God? So if, if substances impede freedom, if substance and substances alter our way of life more toward a self-orientation and how we feel, this is obviously moving in a direction away from right. our responsibility to love our neighbor. Mm -hmm. So and, it's and love it of self over love of neighbor. Yeah, and it, and it, it inhibits the will mm -hmm. to, to choose that. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and the inclination of substance 
you know, that, that this substance abuse leads to further abuse and a yeah. greater need. So at first it's like a little yeah. puff of some, yeah. some parsley and it's like, you know, <laughs> whoa, man, I'm looking at the world all so differently right now. And then eventually it turns into a J, then it turns into a blunt, yeah. then a bong's in front of you. And then Gravi now you're- Gravity bongs. And now you have bongos. I don't even know what a gravity <laughs> bong is. What is a gravity you bong? You don't know what a gravity bong is? Uh, Oh, uh, okay. How, I'm not uh, playing Pollyanna right, right now, but it, like seriously, I don't, I don't know. All right. Well, that's uh, for another show. So, yeah, that's what Elon Musk is working on after the Rogan uh, no, show. No, gra <laughs> a gravity bong is you take a big bucket of water, you take a two liter of soda, cut the bottom off, you drill through the top cap, you put a pipe head in there, and then you light, you push it all the way down, you light the lighter, and then as you pull up. You don't even need notes for this, dude. Are you? Yeah. Like, we're, we're, hey, you know what? Stop. We're just going to put the instructions in, in the, the no. comment boxes. No. And, oh, yeah. so, so, <laughs> no, I hear. so then, as you pull up the the, the vacuum created from uh, the water, you know, and the space draws the weed out. Then you unscrew the lid and put your head down and push down, and it. You know, I'm not buying it. am I, I, I so The reason I'm not buying this is that sounds like so much more work than yeah. I've ever seen a pothead do in my uh, life. Do you it's not like gone. snuff. No, it's you not have, like snuff. You have yeah. no idea the lengths that people go <laughs> for pot smoking. And this is a true story. I probably shouldn't tell We this. do. We do know. <laughs> when, when we were kids, we made, um, there was a military surplus store and we bought a gas mask. And then, <laughs> I think uh, I see where this is going. So, um, then, so then we also bought a battery powered um, motor. And we created a gas mask bong where you put the mask on your face, you drilled a <laughs> hole into it, and then you hit a battery pack and you go. And That's a lot of work. It, it's necessity is the mother of invention. That's absolutely right. Yeah, that's that's very impressive. Yeah. <laughs> so just wondering, you know. No, so, you know, I, I haven't smoked weed in years. I, <laughs> I know, it's been hours for me. Been hours, <laughs> <it's>, <laughs> he's smoking weed right now. He's off camera. <laughs> He's, he's, he, he ground up weed and he's doing snuff weed. <laughs> yeah. you know, so, I mean, I think a lot of people, they say, well, alcohol is legal. And, you know, look, I know in my life I've been more drunk than I've been high in moments, right? If I've smoked a, when I was, if I smoke a, yeah. one hit of a joint or, mm. you know, four or five beers, I'm more affected by the beers than I am by the marijuana, so why is one licit and one is not? Well, I don't know. Have you ever had a brownie? I mean, that, like, I feel like I'm on planet Zebulon 7. I well, had yeah, a brownie that's, in college. That's the know. same thing as doing, you know, drinking a half a bottle of scotch. You get drunk or you can get really high. But I think there's, you know, I think people, or at least, you know, Catholicism say, well, yeah, have a drink or two. It's cool. But no, pot, completely not okay. Yeah. But I, I, I know from personal experience that one hit of a, of a joint is not going to get you as impaired or lose your faculties as much as five or six beers. Right. Sure. I mean, but you've got but to- Can you only just do that? And, sure. And, and I, what does it sort of lead to? Mm -hmm. Well, we know? we know that our, our Lord's first miracle was making wine for drunk people, for people yeah. who were already pretty pretty inebriated. Uh, but also, there are they're, they're just different substances. You know, if you have a few drinks, right. you get a little more social, you get a little funnier. You know, if you have too many drinks, you get- very social, and then you pass out. Uh, when you smoke pot, at least I've found this in my experience, I get less funny and stupider uh, without fail. Every, you think you're funnier, but you just you kind of zone out, you get slack-jawed. It really, and it impairs uh, social interaction. I don't know, it doesn't really, yeah. I suppose it's relaxing in the sense that it dulls your mind, but those, mm -hmm. are, those are very different effects. Mm -hmm. Oh, for sure. And, and what people use the substances for. You know, people can use alcohol isolated you know i drank alone yeah you know like and and because they're wallowing in the the woes of their life and obviously that's not going to reconcile them or put them on a track for greater you know yeah. uh, you know health freedom. and freedom I, I remember a quote from uh uh um, fulton sheen and he said, I only ever have two drinks, one for me and one for Jesus, because the third one's always for the devil. <laughs> oh, I like that. I thought that's really yeah, clever. Yeah, I think moderation is is the key element to all of this. And yeah. then, you know, we're talking about marijuana and, these, and now it's becoming legalized across the states in different places. So yeah. before, you know, there was definitely the prohibition as a good Catholic that you couldn't smoke marijuana because it was a justly enacted legal law and you are mm -hmm. obliged to follow the laws. But now that 
there's a lot of states legalizing marijuana, it's opening up the debate again because it's no longer illegal. That's what he just said. Yeah. And, it's, and it's a good debate. <laughs> and and St. Thomas Aquinas well, is I, I, I gave the nuance that if it's illegal, even if it's not bad for you, it's still sinful to mm -hmm. use it in, in um, yeah. So. yeah. So, and then also the medicinal, you know, purposes that, it, that pot is purposed for, you know, with anxiety issues or depression or different things like that, or, or you know, so cancer, cancer, yeah. you have to look at all of these things from many, many different perspectives. And it opens the debate because we need to debate it, you know, yeah. and we need to talk about it because there is a mass amount of people using it. Now, is it something that is occasional? Is it something that's social? Is it something that you just go and get blitzed by yourself? And then, you know, you, you live in this right. kind of altered, yeah. you know, sense of, of society and world and your own response because you're fleeing from responsibility, obviously this is not going mm -hmm. to be good for yeah, you. Yeah, it's simple. Yeah. Now, now here's a story though. There was a saint, Catholic saint, who was addicted to opium. And he was addicted to opium for 30 years and he never stopped. He was, it was a Chinese saint, Mark, uh, Saint Mark, Mark G. Um, Tian Zeng. And he was a doctor and he was a, he was a very educated man, very, he had a good family. And then he came down with a, a stomach ailment and he was prescribed opium and he got addicted to it. Mm. He was hanging out in opium houses. He never stopped taking opium again the rest of his life. Mm. And what happened is that he went to mass every single day and never received communion because he knew he was addicted to opium and he couldn't mm. stop. Wow. Mm. And he actually, he, he prayed for martyrdom because he said, the only way I'm getting to heaven is through martyrdom because I'm never going to stop opium. I know I'm not going to be able to. It's like in his writings and stuff like that? Mm -hmm. or? Wow. And, and and sure enough, during the, the Boxer Revolution, he was martyred. Wow. 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 That is, that's incredible because, I mean, first of all, if you were living during that time in China, you probably have a little opium too. I mean, it wasn't exactly a pleasant yeah. time, mm -hmm. but that is, that is incredible. You, you know, you get what you pray for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, that, and it's the mercy of God too. Exactly. Right. And, so, right. but, but the addictive aspect of it, I think, lessened the moral culpability that he had mm. for, um, you know, using illicit substances. I mean, wouldn't that be yeah. the case that mm -hmm. addiction lessens the culpability? Yes, yeah, and I, I have to share this though. I have uh, my breviary open here to Psalm 143, and it's I think it's very fitting to this story. And it starts out in verse one, Lord, listen to my prayer, turn your ear to my appeal. You are faithful, you are just, give answer. Do not call your servant to judgment for no one is just in your sight. And you could hear the sincerity of this testimony that this guy's going to church every single day petitioning God because he knows his sinfulness before an almighty, powerful, and righteous God. And isn't that true for all of us? I mean, no matter what our substance or what our sin is, that before God, God is ever pursuing us in mm. his mercy. And that when we are honest with ourselves and we're not living this kind of false puritanical exoskeleton of, of, yeah. of a life. Fake. Yeah, it's like, you know, that's, that's the reality that we're called to, is this repentance, to recognize my sin before God as something that is not fruitful. Right. Well, you know, the topic is, are, are we bad Catholics? And of course, the answer is yes, we're all terrible Catholics, Catholic guilt, mea culpa, mea culpa. Uh, but there's obviously a lot of truth in that. You know, some of the greatest saints have thought that they were the greatest sinners. Why? Is it because of false modesty? No. Mm -hmm. It's because that their moral sense is so finely tuned. Such a great That they, they understand, you know, as Hamlet said, not as Hamlet said, I think it's in, uh, no, maybe it is Hamlet. In the course of justice, none of us should see salvation. Mm -hmm. they, and they're so aware of that in a way that, you know, the rest of us who are who don't have as finely tuned a moral sense uh, sort of miss, I think, in our day-to-day -day lives. Mm -hmm. I yeah. agree. Think about St. Faustina. Has, have you guys read the diary of St. Faustina or at least thumbed through some of it? Yeah. She, yeah. Clearly, this woman is one of the holiest people yeah, I have man. ever interacted with in my entire life and my experience of, of reading the scriptures and, and, and saints' lives. And how finely tuned she was to her own sinfulness before the magnificence of the unfathomable mercy of God. And it's so true. St. Francis of Assisi is another mm -hmm. one, right? Right. 
Yeah. Oh, it's so good, man. And that's and that's like when you you talk about bad Catholic, whatever. We're practicing Catholics. Right. I mean, it's like we're yes. practicing this. We're gonna stuff. keep on practicing until we get it right. <laughs> that's huh? we're, and we're not gonna get it right. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna still be practicing until I die. Mm-hmm. It, it's never something you get. But at the at the the the, the centrifuge of all this is really like the most beautiful masses I've ever experienced were when I have seen you know, the, the sinfulness of my own sinfulness. Mm. And, and I've been in just such deep regret about it and just contrite, mm. you know, and then it's like, boom, you know, you get hit with the mercy of God through, through the Eucharist. Like that's been the most amazing. And that, isn't that what we're looking for in drugs and all these other things? Right. I mean, it's like, you know, the hedonistic culture, mm. like we're looking for that feeling, you know, and in Christianity and practicing it, that, that feeling is him, wow. you know, Washing away our sins. And yeah. the, the grace abounds, obviously, in those moments that you're describing. Yeah. But this, I think we all think in our own sin that we're the first person who does something that we don't want to do and doesn't do something that we do want to do, as if St. Paul didn't say precisely that, as if the divine comedy weren't exactly about that problem, as if this isn't the central struggle that we encounter every day. There's something about... Uh, the, the consciousness of sin that uh, you just sort of think that you're isolated. You're the only guy that's going through this. And so certainly that is not the case. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's a big obstacle for confession. It is. You know? What St. Thomas Aquinas, how he describes and colors in his theology of sin and his explanation and catechesis is that sin darkens the intellect. So think about our, our objective realization of the other, you know, that, that I can intellectually deposit a, a real understanding that you are somebody of worth and that I can see Christ in you. But when I, when I sin, all I could see is myself. And in this darkness, all I could focus on is oh, I'm, I'm really messed up. I'm really, really messed yeah. up. And, and in that darkness, the voice of the accuser comes all over us and it isolates us from the pack. And now that's when we're prey. You know, that, that is precisely when we're pray. And in first Peter, you know, the night prayer Tuesday of the bravery, stay sober and alert. Your opponent, the devil is prowling like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him solid in your faith. What is our faith if it's not this constant pursuit of repenting from our sinfulness like you described and coming back with, to Christ with contrition? Like I know that my heart desires more than the substances and the riches of the world that draw me away from the community and most importantly from you, God. So I want to return to you because I know where my heart finds rest. Yeah. Let me just do an awkward segue then. Let's- awkward. <laughs> awkward segue. Amen. <laughs> so here's another thing that bad Catholics do. Swearing. Mm. You swear? I, You know, I actually... I, we just mentioned that I come from New York, so I'm <laughs> fluent. Uh, but I, I, I actually have tried not to in recent years, especially around women, at least. Around men, I guess I'm a little... Well, it's just you and me, fellas. All right, let's start let's talking. Um, Shh, I try not to. but women listening. I, oh, yikes. Okay, good. Um, <laughs> I, I, I have tried not to, and I think the, the more you try not to, the, the uglier it sounds when you hear it. But I don't know. Then I go back home and I slip back into everything, you know? <laughs> yeah. I think for me, it's like a, the occasion of, it's the occasion of sin, mm-hmm. you know, for me, where mm-hmm. it's like I'm around certain people or I'm in a certain environment or I'm tired or, you know, the kids are just, you know. Just like, ah, you know. <laughs> well, I have another <laughs> confession to make. Okay. Beep, beep, Dave Grohl. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I got a <laughs> confession to make. Take These girl. are my confessions. So, I my nickname from one of my best friend's mother was whenever I came over the house, she'd be like, oh, is foul mouth coming over today? <laughs> oh, here's foul mouth again. Because, I mean, every other word was a curse word. This she is, sounds like a smoker, by the way. Oh, I don't, don't want to oh, get back to that. She sounds like totally a smoker. Richie <laughs> that, was another, that was another house that was just nicotine. <laughs> sounds like Painted a New Yorker. Foul mouth oh, yeah, she coming went, over. Foul mouth foul Pagano mouth. over here, you know? My dad used to say that. That's a foul oh, mouth. you got a foul mouth. I'm going to wash it out with soap. You know how much soap <laughs> went into this mouth? Thank you, Mom, by the way. I love you. I love you, Mother. But, you know, it, it, it's true. I mean... 
the expressions, and I find myself even occasionally now, I try to be very, very aware of what I'm saying and what's, you know, popping off of my, of my mouth. And I had this ex awesome experience a number of years back. And it was when my reversion was just, you know, purely just being born out of God's mercy and all of these experiences. And I was reading the scriptures and I, and I was really struck by the Holy Spirit descending upon the apostles in flames of, you know, like a tongue mm -hmm. and right. resting upon right. them, right? And I thought, you know, if the dove is an image of the Holy Spirit, and my mouth, I want the Holy Spirit to rest upon it. My, my mouth is almost like a nest mm -hmm. for the Spirit. And would I want that nest to be filled with thorns? Because every time that I curse, it's almost like a thorn pops right. out, you and, know? Uh, and it was just a really cool prayer for And that's what shifted me from being just such a foul mouth to really making a, a conscientious effort of changing the way that I express myself when I'm frustrated, angry, or I stub my toe and I started using stuff like Shanane or like <laughs> Sasquatch's baby mama or like and whatever. Now, <laughs> and and it just, it started to work. The horn of trident. <laughs> it works. <laughs> you make such a good point though with the with the flaming tongue mm. because the speech is the essential human act. Mm. It's, yeah. the, it's Adam's job in the garden. It's what politics is, is people talking. And you know, to speak well is to think clearly, to write well is to think clearly. Your use of words, Christ is, is the word, right? There, obviously, there is such significance to our use of words. The, the only question I have, though, is this distinction, because I almost never swear out of anger, very rarely, and then I'll just slip into, like, Italian swears that I heard when I was a little <laughs> kid. Uh, but I do swear uh, for comedy. I do, right. like, if it really, you know, if it fixes the joke, I yeah. will do it often with my buddies. I can't, I doesn't, I can't imagine it's good to do that, but there does seem to be a distinction between those two kinds of swearing. Yeah. Well, you know, the Catholic, so true. the Catholic encyclopedia, they actually, it, it actually kind of clarifies that there's cursing and swearing. Now it says, look, in, in popular acceptance, uh, cursing and swearing are confounded with, you know, just kind of base language and, you know, making you know, jokes or um, kind of crass language. But cursing and swearing are very specific, mm -hmm. uh, specific acts. They're not, you know, saying, you know, shit. <gasps> oh, here we go. It Dude. happened. It has been awesome. It's well, not, he's not sorry Italian. to all of our listeners. That's right. <laughs> okay. He's not Italian. <laughs> I'm Slovenian. Because I mean, he said it like that. Yeah. <laughs> we would never say it like that. Uh -uh. Uh -uh. <laughs> so, no, so, you know, cursing is a very specific act. It's calling down, you know, condemnation on a person. And swearing is making an oath by something sacred. Now, those have been conflated with the use of kind of colorful or crass language, but it's not the same thing. GD. Right. So like something like that. Yeah. That's, that's, oh, well, that, that's, that, that's blasphemy. That's, dude, yeah. that turns my stomach. Yeah. I, I hate that too. And some of my family members, it's like, there's so much foul language coming out of their mouth <laughs> that you just get like used to it. It's like, right. oh, that's just uncle Nicky. He's like, that's how he talks, you know? But, but seriously, when somebody uses the Lord's name in vain, mm. complete strangers, yeah. And I don't care if I'm in clerics or not. Like I always Roundhouse say something. kick him. Oh yeah, right. The, give him a boot to the face, you know? <laughs> Good. Oh, it, it bothers me. So That's the worst thing for me. He's got some interesting- So, uh, so here's, here's a little, I think, something that's going to help make a distinction between cursing and swearing and foul language. So St. Paul in Ephesians 4.29, he says very clearly, no foul language should come out of your mouths but only such as is good for needed edification that it may impart grace to those who hear, right? So- He's really talking about, you know, uh, custody of the tongue and making sure that what you're saying is um, edifies the people that you're talking to. Mm. But St. Paul in Philippians 3.8 says the word shit. I mean, he does. It's right there in the Bible. Well, it might be edifying for the people he's writing to. <laughs> well, it is because he was using it in a proper um, uh, colorful way. He was, so, he was trying to say something was base. Right. He's right? like, look. I, I regard everything to be, this is this is the uh, this is the clean version of the Bible, but I re, I also regard everything to be a loss, on account for the surpassing knowledge of Jesus Christ my Lord. But if you look at the actual Greek uh, word for it, uh, Strong's Concordance uh, word for forty six fifty seven, it's a uh, skubalon. Yep, skubalon. Right, and if you look at it, it is very clearly that is the Greek way of saying. Shit. Mm -hmm. and it, 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 so Paul is saying, look, everything else is shit compared to Jesus Christ. 
And that may sound a little bit crass, but it's it's used for dramatic purpose mm -hmm. and saying, look, this is how worthless everything else is compared to Jesus. So is he swearing or cursing? No. No, it's is precise he, language. It's very precise. Mm -hmm. And there, I believe there's times where that type of precision, especially in a culture where these, I don't think these words are quite as um, taboo as they used to be. And again, you know, there's the, the concept of it. It's what's in your heart and what comes out of your mouth. I mean, are you looking for, you know, condemnation when you say the word shit or something else like that? Or are you, you know, is it something that has lost some of its its weight, you know? Mm. Well, yeah. Of and yeah. You, you, just that reflection in language, uh, since, since we're among friends here on the Catholic talk show, I'll bring up Mr. Martin Luther. Uh, the, the crazier he oh, gets. Oh, he was scatologically he was, inclined. He was scatologically, yeah, I think it was essential to him. He, I th didn't he, he, write, he wrote the uh, commentary on Romans on the commode. Imagine, imagine if uh, he had a modern colonic irrigation, as Father oh. Rutler says. Imagine the torrent <laughs> of commentary he could unleash. Uh, but, you know, the, the later he gets in his life, the more irate he gets, the more heretical he gets, the more out of control he gets the more vicious his language becomes. Uh, you know, the cursing, the swearing, the uh, it becomes imprecise. He loses his hold on the language. And uh, uh, that that's the threat. You know, I mean, that's the danger. Uh, when you speak loosely, then you're losing your, your hold on your thoughts and on what you're conveying to the world. Mm, yeah, excellent point. So real quick, you know, we, I don't think a, a good episode <laughs> of, of uh, being Can a bad Catholic without really getting into talking about alcohol. Mm. Now, We've already did a show on on alcohol, and I think yeah. we've really covered a lot of things. I had a breakfast on alcohol, so <laughs> yeah, before this recording. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's wh that's why your family's here. <laughs> <laughs> and I was visibly seen walking into <laughs> Cast Media Studios, the building, <laughs> oh with gosh. a frozen box of. <laughs> Modelo Especial. <laughs> this is a true story. This though. is a true yeah. story. And yeah. this just happened early not, morning yeah, at sunrise. In morning, <laughs> nine in the morning, Father Rich is Priest walking comes in, in with 12 a, frozen bottles of Modelo. God, he's, like, he's like, no, these will be perfectly thawed out by the time we're done. <laughs> 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 just leave them on the counter in the sun. They'll be just great. Leave here by, by the time 1015 rolls around, <laughs> the sun just peeking over the hills. Yeah. So, no, two things I wanted to bring up about uh, alcohol. Uh, one is uh, Venerable Matt Talbot. Mm -hmm. uh, Venerable Matt Talbot, um, I think, really is on his way to becoming the patron saint of alcoholics. Mm -hmm. um, he, was, uh, he was in Dublin, and he was just an incredibly hard drinker. He was, you know, going through the pubs everywhere, um, drinking every day to the point Irishman? where— Irishman? Jeez. I'll get it. Yeah. <laughs> It just doesn't add it up. Doesn't add it up. doesn't add up. Mm. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. That's culturally insensitive. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Irish. They don't have any feelings, anyways. <laughs> I think I think the our Irish I think so our dull. Irish listeners are using choice language right now <laughs> toward yeah. your direction. Yeah, their Dela feelings Cross. are dead and numbed from alcohol. Yeah, in our comment sections, let us know what you think about Delacrosse, our Irish brothers and sisters. No, I heard about him, but I never <laughs> knew. So, it was yeah, so when he started drinking when he was like twelve, right? Yeah. Because it, it, they were very poor, and he had, he was working as a delivery boy for an alcohol distributor, and he just started drinking and drinking and drinking, and he drank you know, every day for 18 years, from the time he was 12 to the time he was 30. And it ruined his life. His life really never got off the ground because of it. Um, he was broke, had no money. And then finally, one day, he had no ability to buy alcohol. So he's hanging outside of the bars, hoping that one of his friends would invite him in for a drink. And he stayed there for hours and no one did because they were so sick of him mooching off of him buying drinks mm -hmm. for him. So that day he went home, went back to his mom and said, I'm taking the pledge. And he never had another drink again in his life. And he went to daily mass every day for the rest of his life. And um, he took the money, he worked really hard, and then all the money that he ever borrowed to drink, he paid back. Yeah. Wow. Wow. And then, you know, on his, on his deathbed, um, they found the, the, all kinds of mortifications that he would wear under his clothes, and he really made a massive difference in, you know, in his life. So he's on the way to becoming probably one of the patron saints of alcoholics. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. When when you and I went to Ireland, we were staying probably about a block or two from where his old stomping grounds were. Yeah. This is an aspect that I think some of our friends of other varieties of Christian belief 
uh, don't quite get about the Catholic Church, but Chesterton wrote about this very well, which is the way he knew that uh, the Catholic Church was right is that it would be criticized for opposite reasons. It was too ascetic. It was too decadent. It was too. This, it was too this. It was too that. And uh, you see that. I mean, you see that danger with alcohol. It's it's easy to abstain for some people, and it's easy to become a drop down drunk. Uh, the balance is the question. Can you? You know, obviously, if you if you become an alcoholic, if you become a drunk, you've got to abstain. But for the rest of us, can you hold those things in tension? You know, uh, well, the other thing Chesterton said is. The uh, heresy is not the promotion of vice over virtue. It's the promotion of one virtue to the exclusion of all of the others. Can you hold these things in balance? That's what makes a Catholic church. And that virtue yeah. is that via media, you know, finding mm -hmm. that right. middle ground of moderation. I, I can't help but share the story about when I was growing up. And, you know, much like Ryan Delacross, I, you know, I explored with a lot of different uh, drugs and alcohol and all these different things. And after my second knee surgery, when I was rehabilitating and turned to God in prayer, none of my friends came to visit me after I got my surgery. I didn't have any money, so none of them were around so that, you know, we weren't partying or anything. And then there was one particular friend who said, hey, Richie, can I get some of those, those uh, pain pills from you? <coughs> and, and it just, it really like spoke to me like, you know, where are my friends? Yeah. Mm. And Matt tells me. Doing I'm snuff. <laughs> <laughs> Being dandies. Can, can I get a little sniff from you? And yeah. in a place where I was truly isolated and by myself and in prayer, I recognized I really don't belong in this community that I've tried to develop over the past, you know, four or five, six years or whatever as a 20-year-old young, young man. And that was the catalyst for me to take the pain pills and trash them, to take the pot and the, you know, and to trash the snort it. and the smoke and the drinking. This morning, the snorting, <laughs> shooting, you know, all that, all that stuff. You know, and I, and I threw it all away and the freedom that came from that experience mm. of throwing it away was incredible. Mm. And I even went through, I had, you know, the CDs back in the day for all of our younger listeners that have no idea what a CD <laughs> is. You know, I had this huge thing of CDs of like gangster rap and heavy metal and like all this stuff. And, and rap metal. <laughs> and rap metal, <laughs> gangster metal. Best uh -huh. invention gangster ever. <laughs> and I, I was going outside to break the CDs and a friend of mine had called from down the street. He's like, no, don't break the corn yeah. CD. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, dude, just give them to me. And I'm like, I'm going out to the trash can right now and breaking them. And before he got there, I mean, I just like shattered everything. But the Lim biscuit, corn, Lim biscuit, but POD, POD's Christian. <laughs> no, don't throw that one away. I kept Lincoln Park. I did keep Lincoln Park. <laughs> There's a whole theological debate to be had there. <laughs> well, does it quite? Uh... But you know, the that experience that I had, it was a great euphoria because. I was breaking ties with all of these different substances and even the audio substances mm -hmm. that kind of gave me that escape. And I started to confront my own reality and I started to work with it and look at it differently. And now I started to see God was so much more intimately involved in the details of my life than I had realized. And that gave me great joy and excitement. Mm -hmm. And then I started becoming more and more aware how he was with me every step. Then I started developing a relationship to the Blessed Mother and then the Rosary and the Seven Sorrows of Our Lady took over, I mean, like just took over my life. And I just started walking every day with her with a complete dependency on God. And I even walked away from alcohol for quite a while, like six or seven months. Oh, it was, it was golden years and golden time of my life. Mm. I love it. Great memories. Well, and you that. make a great point comparing the, the audio, what you're hearing, to all these other drugs and things. I mean, it's the most important sense. Mm -hmm. Plato says so, and, and mm. God says so, right? God speaks mm -hmm. to us. He's always speaking. He's the, the we're hearing flesh, him, the yeah. word, yeah, the word made flesh. And uh, it, when you get out of the car and you've been listening to all that, that gangsta metal or whatever you were listening to, you get out of the car feeling differently than if you were listening to Brahms or something or Bach. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that, that really does affect the rest of your day. Mm -hmm. Truly. Yeah. All right, bad Catholics. You guys are bad Catholics, but maybe you're good Catholics. We're all, we're all bad, good Bad, good Catholics. <laughs> good. Yeah, I hope, we, I I hope think you that, guys have some resolution. I, 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 uh, in conclusion. I think that's the point. Anybody who would think they're a good Catholic probably isn't. Anyone who's a bad Catholic and recognize it, that's the first step towards actually becoming a good Catholic. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So here's the thing. I think in lieu of doing an inquisition, you know, 
this time. Why don't you tell us what you've got going on and what's going on um, yeah. that you know you got coming up here? We've got, so I'm going straight from here. I'm going to go do my show today, the Michael Knowles show at the Daily Wire. And I got to tell you, talk about grace abounding. Uh, you know, every day I wake up, I look at the news cycle and I cover uh, political news and I give some commentary on it. This week may be unprecedented in all of human history. Uh, we'll be talking, obviously, about Chief Liawatha, uh, Focahontas, Pocahonky. We'll be talking about her on the show and uh, so, so much else. I mean, there is uh, the, there actually isn't enough time in my show to, to get <laughs> this, through to that. And this then, is the great golden age of content for you. It is the great goal. You, you can't do comedy anymore, unfortunately, because we've now transcended satire. But you can <laughs> at least analyze what's going on. It's really uh, terrific news cycles for that. And then I think afterward, I've... I've, I've, you've inspired me. I've got to go get a cigar and a drink. <laughs> I, uh, you know, actually, we're doing a show today. The, uh, we're doing a show, the backstage show, where I think the Daily Wire was only founded so that all of us could sit around and smoke cigars and drink on camera. So we'll be doing one of those shows. My kind of guys. Well. So yeah. where, My can, where, guys. where can people find uh, your show and subscribe and all that? So people can go to dailywire.com if they want to shell out a little bit of money you'll get your leftist tears tumbler. And that's very important these days. It's <laughs> FDA approved, highly recommended for the torrents that have been coming down recently. Um, or if you're a cheapskate, you can go to YouTube, you can see the first half and then you can listen to the whole thing and you can subscribe on iTunes. So you can always get it. It's very, you know, it's very important. It, it, skip the box, skip the Brahms in your car, just plug in the Michael Knowles show. You'll be all right. <laughs> throw away your corn CDs. Throw away your corn. Throw away all your new metal. <laughs> Put the joint down, pour your drink out, quit swearing. <laughs> and go and subscribe That's for right. heaven's sake. Yeah, <laughs> great. Well, hey, man, I, we really appreciate having you. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, it was awesome. such a pleasure. Thank really you for awesome, having me, awesome, Michael. Yeah. All right. Well, all right, bad Catholics. Let's go. Let's go have a drink and a yeah. smoke. <laughs> <laughs> I hope those Modellos have defrosted. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for joining us for the Catholic Talk Show. We'll catch you on the next episode. Peace. Thanks, guys.